My friends, when you think of the country Somalia, what exactly is it that you think of? Crime? Poverty? Corruption? More than likely, if you've seen anything regarding the country on the news in the past several decades, then any of the things that I just listed is probably going to be true. The history of Somalia is something that is rooted in struggle, poverty, and war. And it's safe to say that for a long period of time, Somalia would have probably won a competition, if there ever was one, for the world's most failed state. But in order to understand how Somalia got to where it is today, we're going to have to take a little bit of a step back, and we're going to need to take a look at our favorite thing that we like to do on this channel, historical context. Let's go ahead and start with where this is located. Somalia is the easternmost country in Africa. Situated on the Horn of Africa, the country stretches from just south of the equator all the way up north to the Gulf of Aden, and exists in a very crucial region region between Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the Arabian Peninsula, and also Southwest Asia. Its capital, Mogadishu, is located just north of the equator, and sits on the coast of the Indian Ocean. In the southwest are the only permanent rivers in Somalia, the Juba and Shebel. And with the exception of some mountains that are in the very north of the country, Somalia is typically very dry and very hot. This relative flatness is broken only by two large valleys that are cutting through the land. And this geography allowed the mostly nomadic people that would live here for the last several thousand years to stay nomadic and to take their livestock along with them, letting them graze as they traveled. In fact, even today, three-fifths of Somalia citizens practice some form of nomadic pastoralism, or agro-pastoralism, which is a mix of farming crops and pastoralism. The Somalis are typically clan-based Muslims, and this means that family clans would interact and wage war, forming alliances and rivalries, etc., that would make, honestly, if we're going to be looking about that in history, the Hatfields and the McCoys, if you're familiar with them, look like a simple squabble between otherwise friendly neighbors. We are talking about feuds that all across the country would last multiple generations and rivalries between clans that stretch back hundreds of years. In the 21st century, many Somalis remain more loyal to their clans than to the actual idea of a Somali national identity. From what we can tell, the Somali people trace their ancestry back to the Hamatic people who settled on the country's two rivers that originate from Central Africa. These groups of people would interact with the Arab traders who introduced Islam to the region, and the Arabs would then intermarry with the migrating Hamatic people to give rise to the Somali ethnicity. After marrying into the local women, these Arabs would then form a patrilineal clan structure, which would would eventually give rise to the four dominant clans of the region. The four dominant clans that we would then see are the Hawaii, the Darud, the Asak, and the Deer though any number of these I am more than likely mispronouncing. One has to understand that if we're talking about things with clan structures, these are things that are so important in Somalia that the average person that you could talk to would more than likely be able to trace back their lineage by several generations just in order to be able to say where it is that they came from because that is a huge part of their life and culture. And so these clans are significantly more important than many people would think. The Asak clan, as an example, populates northwestern Somalia and has effectively declared the region independent and named it Somali land. The Asaks were colonized by the British, and they have their own administrative, economic, and security structure, though we're going to be talking more about the Somaliland issue later, which is a whole other giant mess of worms. The Hawaii clan then populates southern and central Somalia, including the capital Mogadishu. The clan's forefather is Arir Somali, and these people have been a major player in the country's conflicts in a bid in order to achieve political power. The Deer clan goes and inhabits the northern parts of Somalia and includes a subgroup called the Bim. Mal. The Bimal populate the southern part of the country and are famous for leading an extended resistance against Italian occupation. This clan is also spread out in the neighboring countries of Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Kenya, which, of course, since we're going to be talking about this and colonization is a natural part of talking about Africa's history, we're going to be talking more about Italy's role in the country later. The Darud clan has formed a mostly autonomous region named Puntland. This is something that is complete with its own president, a system of administration, and this region occupies most of the Horn of Africa portion of Somalia and has the lowest rate of poverty at only 27%, which is still rather high, but it is significantly lower than Mogadishu's rate of 57%. The clan traces its ancestry back to a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, which is something of a great status symbol to them. The Darud also remains suspicious of the southern clans, and this has hindered political unification of the Somali people. 
Now, if any of this is confusing you, I understand. The closest thing that we could probably associate this with clans and autonomous regions is by looking at Georgia. And no, I'm not talking about the United States, Georgia. I mean, Georgia, Georgia, like in Europe, in the Caucasus. As inside of here, there are areas that fought Russia over a decade ago. South Ossetia and Abkhazia were states with mostly autonomous self-governance, but still, technically speaking, they were considered part of Georgia, whether they liked it or not, by the larger world. And so it is the same with the Darud, whom are part of the country, but also don't necessarily want to be, and they do not trust the rest of the country at all. And what it is that we're talking about here right now, those are the major clans, of course, but you have to understand there are many, 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 many more clans besides those. Those are just the four major ones and the greatest political powers in the region. I mean, genuinely, when we were talking about the country of Somalia, it's really less of a single unified country and more so a territory with many different autonomous self-governments that are inside of it that struggle to try to govern the country at all anywhere. The only real difference between any of them is that diplomatically, none of these clans are actually recognized as independent. It is all still technically part of the country of Somalia. And if we are going to give perhaps what is the biggest biggest display of interclan dynamics and how exactly it works, then really you can look no further than the Somali Civil War, which is something that ravaged the country over the course of the early 1990s. But we're going to end up circling back to that later. In fact, the more that I go on and talk about all this stuff, the more I realize how many things it is that I'm going to have to circle back to. This is a really big issue that is happening everywhere, guys. So, okay, breaking things down further, the Somali language belongs to the Kushtic branch of the Afro-Asiatic language family. And despite there being several regional dialects, it is understood throughout the country and is an official language. So at the very least, the clans have that going for it. The second official language is Arabic, which is spoken chiefly in northern Somalia and in the coastal towns. And because of its post-colonial ties, English as well as Italian are also frequently spoken in colleges and universities, with Swahili also being spoken in parts of the southern portion of the country. In 1973, they would even adopt a version of the Latin alphabet because, incredibly, prior to this time, Somali had actually been an unwritten language which is most certainly wild. Virtually all Somalians, we're talking 98.6% are Muslim, and they specifically follow the teaching and practices of the Sunni branch of Islam. The population of Somalia would increase annually by about 3% in the late 20th to early 21st centuries, and sadly, the country would also have the highest infant mortality rate in the world. The Somali population has an average life expectancy of 50 years. That is considerably lower than that of the neighboring countries, and Somalia also has a relatively young population, with more than two-fifths of the population being under the age of 15. Aside from the raising and selling of livestock, the major crops are bananas, sugarcane, rice, cotton, vegetables, grapefruit, mangoes, and papayas. The acacia trees of the thorny savanna in southern Somalia supply good timber and are a major source of charcoal. But charcoal production has long exceeded ecological acceptable limits. It's just not something that is practical considering the limitation of the land itself. And even worse, most of the charcoal isn't even used in Somalia. The lion's share of charcoal typically has been sent to Kenya where they can actually afford comparative luxuries. As time goes on and the environment grows worse, Somali herdsmen have had to range wider and further in order for their cattle and livestock to barely survive. And it isn't made better by burning the few trees that they have in order to make charcoal predominantly for other countries. They've been stripping the land for decades, and it's only gotten worse in the last decade as Somalia has suffered brutal droughts due to like six failed rainy seasons in a row. And then this was followed by this year, the worst flooding the country has ever experienced in over a century. And if you all want to see how bad it is that I'm talking about here, just look at the footage that you can see behind me right here. This is some absolute insanity, especially for a country that for years has been experiencing severe drought. But either way, let's go ahead and pivot back into history because we're going to need to talk about how Somalia came to be Somalia and in the situation that it is in the first place. Remember how I talked about Arab traders. So between the 7th and the 10th century, immigrant Muslim Arabs and the Persians would build a network of trading posts along the Gulf of Aden and the Indian Ocean coasts. Many of the early Arab geographers would mention these trading posts and these sultanates that would subsequently grow out of them, but they didn't really have any kind of idea of what the interior of Africa looked like. 
In 1839, though, the balance of power in the area would start to change drastically with the first encroachment of Europeans onto the Horn of Africa. The British became interested in the northern Somali coast following the establishment of the British coaling station at Aden, and this being the short route to India. The Aden garrison that was created there would rely heavily on the importation of meat from the adjacent Somali coast. This was the era of steamships, and France would seek its own coaling station, so it acquired, we're going to to say here in colonial terms, Obak on the Afar coast in 1862, later thrusting eastward and developing the Somali port of Djibouti. Farther north, Italy would open a station in 1869 at Aseb, which with later acquisitions would become the colony of Eritrea. Even the Egyptians wanted in on the action, and they themselves would colonize portions of Somalia for around 20 years before subsequently getting out of the colonization game. Because look, even if the Egyptians kind of understood the culture of Somalia better, the British most certainly were better at colonization. And so subsequently, the British would take over the Egyptian colonies that they had there. Between 1884 and 1886, treaties of protection were drawn up with the main northern Somali clans, guaranteeing them their, quote, independence. Somali territory was not fully ceded to Britain, but rather a British protectorate was proclaimed and vice consuls were appointed in order to maintain order and control trade at the key economically important trading towns. The interior of the country was still largely left undisturbed, with only the coast ever really being affected. But at roughly the same time, France had been trying to expand its colony from Obak, and they were on the path to war with the British over control of Somalia. Peace would win the day, though, when negotiations would work, and an Anglo-French border agreement was signed in 1888, thus clearly defining the boundaries of each country's interest in the area. At the same time as this, though, the Italians were making moves to extend the borders of their Somalian colony in Eritrea, while also pushing into Ethiopian lands. Within a year, the Italians had managed to take over large chunks of Somalia, with their end goal being of conquering Ethiopia, and had significant influence and control over nearly the entire Indian Ocean of Somalia at one point, and this was immense. To the south of the Juba River, the British East Africa Company would hold Jubaland until 1895, when this then became part of Britain's East Africa Protectorate. Then, of course, for the next 30 years or so, the colonial powers would end up doing what colonial powers do best, and subsequently try to increase their influence over both the people and culture of an area. And, to some extent, this actually ended up proving pretty effective for both Britain and also for Italy. They would end up seeing some decent success from this. There weren't really all that many rebellions, and even then, the borders didn't really go and change until... 1936 subsequently rolled around. Which, what happened in 1936, you may wonder. Ha, huh. well. Well, that would be the Italian conquest of Ethiopia over the course of 1935 to 1936, which, upon completion, would bring the Ethiopian and Italian Somali territories together within the framework of Italy's very short-lived East African Empire. And so it was then that the Italian province of Somaliland became the province of Somalia. Over the course of World War II, then, the British protectorate would end up being evacuated in 1940, but was subsequently recaptured with Italian Somalia in 1941, this being when Ethiopia was also liberated. With the exception of French Somaliland, all the Somali territories were then united under the British military administration. In 1948, the protectorate would revert to the colonial office, the Ogaden region and the Hod region were gradually surrendered to Ethiopia, and in 1950, the Italians would return to southern Somalia with 10 years to prepare the country for independence under a United Nations trusteeship. The British protectorate in this event would become independent on June 26, 1960. On July 1st, Italian Somalia would follow suit, and the two territories would then join as the Somali Republic. The official name of Somalia then is the Federal Republic of Somalia, and the blue flag with the white star in the center is the official flag of it. This was something that was created in 1954 and has been used ever since. The five-pointed star that you can see on it here is the Star of Unity. And this is something that is meant to represent the five geographic locations that Somalis mainly reside. You have Somalia, formerly known as Italian Somalia or Italian Somali land, Somali land, which is formerly known as British Somali land, Djibouti, formerly known as French Somali land, the Somali region, also known as Ogadend or Somali Galbid, which is located in the eastern part of Ethiopia and mainly inhabited by Somalis, 
and the Northeastern Province, also known as the Northern Frontier District, or NFD, that is located in Northeast Kenya, mainly inhabited by, again, Somalis. The blue background is then something that represents the blue sky and the waters following the coastline of Somalia, the Indian Ocean to the east, the Gulf of Aden to the north, and the Gardafui Channel in between. Now here, of course, is where everything starts to get really, really messy, and this, this is something that would then create the modern problems that we see today, or at least part of it and contribute to it, if you didn't get the idea of the disunity that we've already been talking about. The former colonial rulers tried to help the country modernize and improve, with the issue of Somali unification dominating foreign policy, and the general issue of which areas settled by Somalis to be included in the new government would only cause additional problems with their neighbor Kenya in 1963. Many ethnic Somalis live in the far northeastern corner of Kenya, and their campaign to be freed of Kenyan rule and to be allowed to join Somalia ended up causing a guerrilla war that even spilled over into parts of Ethiopia and would last for four years. And are you ready for it? Are you ready for the really messy part? Because the United States and the majority of the West ended up supplying support to Ethiopia and Kenya, which were pretty key allies in the region, this meant that naturally during the height of the Cold War that the Soviet Union would subsequently send aid to the Somali rebels. Which, of course, was naturally overjoyed to be able to supply any amount of money, weapons, and whatever was necessary in order to be a thorn in the side of the West. Cold War logic, you know. Despite this, in 1967, when the war would end, a new government was formed and Muhammad Haj Ibrahim Igal would take charge as premier. He swiftly set about to ease the tensions and hostilities between Ethiopia and Kenya, and from there, things would begin to settle down. But then in 1969, only a couple years later, the government would shift from being more democratic and from then would become increasingly authoritarian due to the National Assembly being flooded by supporters of the Somali Youth League, this being something that was based primarily in the south of the country. This would then reach a fever pitch in October of 1969 when President Abdirashid Ali Shemark was assassinated, provoking a government crisis which was then quickly taken advantage of by the military who instigated a coup on October 21st, only six days after the president had been killed. Muhammad Egal was overthrown as well as the rest of the prior government with the forming of a Supreme Revolutionary Council and placed at the head of this council and assuming the role of head of state would be the commander of the army, a man who would live in infamy in Somalian history, Major General Muhammad Siad Bar. And this is where things get even spicier, okay? Because known to his people as Siad, the new leader would immediately institute a concept known as scientific socialism, something that he claimed was fully compatible with his country's ardent devotion to Islam, because remember, of course, that over 98% of the country was Muslim. He then went about declaring a campaign that was meant to liberate the country from poverty, from disease, and also from ignorance. He was hailed as the father of his people, with the revolution itself actually being referred to as the mother of its people. In fact, we're talking about at the height of Soviet influence, slogans would proclaim a trinity of Comrade Marx, Comrade Lenin, and Comrade Siad. These were things that were posted on official party orientation centers throughout the country. And of all his social programs, the one that Barr did actually institute, that thankfully did in fact show results, was his campaign against literacy. This is the program that would introduce a written language for the first time in Somalia that actually was for the native Somalian language. And so a number of you are probably thinking right now, okay, well, Stack, that doesn't actually sound too bad. I mean, we're talking about a country that before didn't have a written language, so him developing all of these literacy programs and whatnot sounds like a really good idea. What, what, why, why was Siad potentially a bad guy? Well, that is not the legacy that Siad would ultimately end up leaving for his people, because there is one thing that he cared about more than anything else, and that is maintaining power and control and authority over the Somalian population. You see, my friends, Siad held an iron grip on the country and its people, and began to infiltrate the traditional clan structures that have dominated Somali culture for over a thousand years. Clan loyalties were officially outlawed, and clan-inspired behavior became a criminal offense. He maintained his power then in multiple ways, from controlling the courts with judges that he ordered to give ruthless sentences to any enemies of the state. He also had a national security service that was run by his son-in-law, and even a national network of vigilantes known as the Victory Pioneers. Which, I'm just going to go ahead and say this right now, that is probably something that would go down in history as the weakest name that a group of hired and psychotic killers 
dollars has ever been called, but it's what they were. And so after going and fighting and losing a war with Ethiopia in the late 1970s, the stability of Siad's regime would face a ton of pressures from the clans. An aborted military coup in April 1978 led to the formation of two opposition groups, the Somali Salvation Democratic Front, or SSDF, that was mostly supported by the Majertine clans from central Somalia, and the Somali National Movement, or SNM, that was composed primarily of Isak clansmen from the north. Formed in 1982, both of these organizations would undertake guerrilla operations from bases in Ethiopia, and this, combined with Western pressure, would end up causing Said to improve relations with Kenya and Ethiopia, culminating in a peace accord that was signed in 1988 that obliged each side to cease supporting Somali anti-government guerrillas. It sounds all well and good, but then you have to remember that, okay, if these rebels are no longer based in Ethiopia or Kenya or anywhere else, then that means that they are going to be going over and actually fighting in Somalia itself, which means that a civil war is going to become inevitable. But before any of that could happen, Siad, well, uh, he had to go be a monster and commit as many human rights violations and horrible crimes as he could possibly commit. And considering that I'm talking about this on YouTube, I can only pray that the YouTube gods look upon me favorably when I talk about this, but um, what we are talking about here is the removal and eradication of a people. We're talking about a state-sponsored eradication of the Asak people of Somalia. It is something that starts with Geno, and it ends with the word side. I, um, I, I don't think that necessarily you all know what it is that I mean. This event is something that would last for two brutal years, from 1987 through 1989. Between this time period, 50,000 and 100,000 Isaac clan members would meet their end, but local reports would even claim up to 200,000 may have been lost. The event that we are talking about here is something that would include straight up leveling of the cities of Hargesia, of which 90% of it was destroyed, and Barao, of which 70% of it was destroyed. For those of you who are more familiar with history, if you wanted to compare this to anything, this is 1944 Warsaw ghetto levels of destruction that we're talking about. The goal of this was to wipe the Asak off the face of the earth. Half a million Asak refugees would flee across the border to safety in Ethiopia in what has been described as one of the fastest and largest forced movements of people in African history. This is something that would create the world's largest refugee camp at the time, with another additional 400,000 people displaced. This is one of history's most forgotten about large-scale losses of life, and nearly nobody in the Western world outside of diplomats and journalists have ever talked about it. If you all want to understand the severity of what it is that I'm talking about here, and just how incredibly brutal this whole thing was, Siad went as far as to create a mechanized section of the Somali armed forces that I kid you not was called the Isak Exterminators, which of course is a far deadlier name than the Victory Pioneers, but th that is a blatant statement of intention right there. And the evil that was tasked to these guys consisted of a systemic pattern of attacks against unarmed civilian villages, against watering holes, against grazing areas, all throughout northern Somalia to wipe out men, women, and children and forcing their survivors to flee or perish. These towns were then later looted for all that they had and left abandoned. Their job was to create ghost towns. At the time that they were doing this, they would simultaneously forcibly have their way with the women of the region, essentially at will after they'd killed off all the men. Siad's forces would also plant over one million landmines in Asak territory, and even after the killing had stopped, the Asak were still subjected to degradation by local officials, putting into place the most hardline policies into effect against the Asak peoples instead of the rest of the country. Now, the Asak clan lived in northern Somalia, in what used to be known as British Somalia. After being being given independence, they referred to their part of the country as Somali land, as opposed to the Italian Somalia region, which was just known as Somalia after receiving independence. They quickly joined together to make a government, but one can't think of what could have happened if they had decided to stay separate and stay as their own country all of those decades ago. Perhaps the Assac genocide may never have happened. We just don't know. And that's not how it played out anyways. So the Assac genocide and Saeed's complete turn of heel into a straight-up absolute dictator basically set the stage for civil war and lit the fuse for the whole situation to explode. And in 1991, it did.
It is here at this point that we get into the most famous part of Somalian history, the Somalian Civil War. Facing the closure of their bases in Ethiopia, the SNM began attacking government forces in their home region, provoking a bitter conflict. The Ogaden clan of Somalia, who had been absorbed into the army and militias, felt betrayed by the peace agreement with Ethiopia, feeling that the country had given away lands that their clan had occupied in Ethiopia for literally centuries. And so they began to desert and attack members of Siad's clan, the Darud. At this point, Siad began to lose control of the country as a whole, and focused on retaining tight control of Mogadishu. Clan-based guerrilla opposition groups began popping up left and right, following the example of the SNM and SSDF. In January 1991, forces of the Haoye clan's United Somali Congress, or USC, led a popular uprising that overthrew Saeed and drove him to seek asylum amongst his own clan. Outside of Mogadishu, all the more powerful clans that had access to military equipment and weapons began to carve up the country into their own spheres of influence. The government in the south essentially evaporated, losing control of all parts of the country and its people, and would only manage to survive at the local level in the SSDF-controlled region in the northeast of the country. In May of 1991, the SNM would take control of the former British Somaliland region in the north, declaring the 1960 constitution to be null and void, and claim their own independence. Looking back to their history, they would then call themselves the Republic of Somaliland. In Mogadishu, the USC would assume control of the capital after having ousted Said from power. Unfortunately, though, during the course of trying to set up a new government, a bitter feud would break out between Hawaii clan factions, and this would subsequently lead to two rival warlords who would begin tearing the country apart, trying to obtain power. These groups were then called the Somali Salvation Alliance, or SSA, and the Somali National Alliance, or the SNA. They would even fight against a regrouped Sayad and his forces known as the Somali National Front, or SNF, in order to try and control the South. War and devastation were brought to the countryside, and rural areas where most of the country's agriculture in the South would be derived from were completely obliterated by the combat. Famine began to spread rapidly and it was made worse by militias and warlords stealing supplies by force, or, if not that, taking a huge cut from local farmers if they did even leave anything behind for the locals. As time went on and the situation only grew worse, footage of malnourished, starving, and dying children started making its way into the outside world, and Western powers began to take notice. In December of 1992, the United States would lead a multinational force that numbered more than 35,000 troops, and for a time, this caused a precarious peace to exist among the key players when it came to the clans. Another benefit was that relief aid and supplies were finally able to go to those that needed it, instead of those who would take it at the end of a rifle barrel. This effort, at least for a moment, gave everyone a chance to try to catch their breath, and would lead to an opportunity for the United Nations to attempt to help negotiate peace, which would show early promise. In early 1993, 15 Somali factions would sign peace and disarmament treaties in the capital of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. And it seemed for a time that this was going to be a glimmer of hope. For just a brief moment, everything seemed like it was going to work out. But by June, the situation had deteriorated drastically. This would only continue to get worse, and fighting would again become common, culminating in an international incident that would become known later as the Battle of Mogadishu. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of the Battle of Mogadishu, naturally, but it is in and of itself a very good story. So if you all actually want to hear that, then go ahead and like this video and let me know in the comment section below that that is something that you would want to see. But to sum it up, effectively by this point, the Americans have decided that there were certain warlords that, well, the peacemaking process simply wasn't going to work out for. These were individuals that were actively making peace talks more difficult by continuously raiding aid shipments and attacking other warlords, even during times of truce or peace. And the warlord that they deemed to be the biggest problem was an individual by the name of Muhammad Farah Adid. His constant interference would then lead to Operation Gothic Serpent, which tried to go and eliminate him, but that whole thing did not work out very well. Which again, if you all want to see a video on it, then by all means, let me know. We're going to have to move on though. Now again, that is not something that I'm going to talk about in detail here, but the short of it is that the battle was considered to be a massive fiasco for U.S. forces. And effectively, it would spell the end of U.S. involvement in Somalia, like they just weren't, with Bill Clinton then subsequently removing troops soon afterwards. Within a year of the Battle of Mogadishu, even the UN would go and withdraw its troops. 
And thus, effectively, from that moment on, the next 20 years were rapidly filled with clan-based violence. Numerous attempts were made at trying to broker peace between the different factions, and various groups would try to gain an upper hand and gain power and influence, but ultimately, none were really able to succeed. Meanwhile, over the course of all of this, innocent civilians were frequently getting caught in the crossfire and suffering, not only due to the lack of any kind of government services and infrastructure or the actual war that was going on, but also due to the effects of climate change, which were hitting the Horn of Africa and Somalia especially hard. The rainy seasons during this time gradually began to fail, and the landscape would suffer frequent droughts as the land became more and more and more dry. Raising livestock, as I had talked about from the beginning, had always been a staple export of the rural areas of Somalia. And so due to the combination of climate change and clan-based violence that was running rampant across the countryside, hundreds of thousands of people were repeatedly forced to flee to other countries as refugees. Those who could would try to flee to the United States, where more opportunities and a safer living condition was available. In fact, so many Somalis moved to Minnesota that that state boasts the largest percentage of Somali population of any state at just over 65,000 people, comprising 1% of Minnesota's entire population. In fact, Somali-American presence is so strong in Minnesota that they elected the first Somali-American U.S. member of Congress in 2019, Ilan Omar. Now, regardless of what you think about the individual, this is not a channel that gets into politics, but it is important to mention this for geopolitical purposes. Omar was born in Mogadishu in 1982, and her family would manage to secure asylum to the U.S. in 1995. But either way, back to the refugees in the Civil War. In 1998, another portion of the war-torn country, the SSDF-controlled area in the Northeast, identified as Puntlin, announced its intentions to self-govern. Now, unlike the self-declared Republic of Somaliland, Poland did not claim complete independence from Somalia. It instead sought to maintain a part of the country as an autonomous region, with the goal of reuniting the country as a federal republic. But unification wasn't going to be coming anytime soon. During this time, anyone that was staying in the country had to do whatever it is that they could to survive. During a famine in 2011, 250,000 Somalis would end up perishing due to starvation or violence. The number of malnourished children in Somalia would reach 1.5 million at one point as well, and for about a quarter of those children, the starvation would end up being fatal. There was no army, there was no police, there was no fire department, there was no kind of services, and unemployment experience. Exploded. For many of those who were living on the coast, they would end up getting frustrated at watching container ships and tankers being sent through their waters and onto the Gulf of Aden, and as a result of this, and the potential to achieve some kind of wealth, would resort to piracy. Throughout the 2000s and peaking in 2011, Somali piracy would become so rampant that Hollywood would even make the film Captain Phillips about a ship captain and his crew that was taken hostage by Somali pirates. And it is here that the world suddenly would once once again take notice of Somalia, this being only really after their profits started to take a hit, and many ships would begin to hire private security contractors in order to try and protect them, or would request armed military escorts from the world's various navies. But still, the piracy problem would persist, and the civil war would rage on until 2012, when a new government would finally be formed, and a democratically elected president would be placed into power, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed. An activist with a moderate stance was elected into office, and his administration would be tasked with rebuilding a country. Now, of course, that is not something that is going to be easy, mind you, and the process was made even more difficult by the formation of Al-Shabaab in the early 2000s, which, for those who are unaware of this, this is an insurgent group who would seek to establish a Sharia-based Islamic state in Somalia. With its name meaning the youth, Al-Shabaab would hold control over Mogadishu for most of the late 2000s. Meanwhile, on the coast, the local fishermen were suffering the effects of not having a government while foreign fishermen and ships would then regularly encroach into Somali waters illegally in order to fish there. These fishermen would then band together and become pirates, initially in order to try and protect their livelihoods during these terrible circumstances. And this added then to the new government's troubles. In fact, in the city of Ail in Puntland, the pirates even basically set up their own pirate's haven and controlled the city.
city for some time. They even managed during this time to set up a stock market, like a pirate stock market, something where local citizens could fund pirate missions, and if that mission scored a big hit, the investor's profits and the percentage of the take would still be the same. Some wise locals actually set themselves up for life financially by making such investments. But by 2012, the Puntland Maritime Police Force was developed to handle the scourge of piracy in Somali waters. Ever since the new government took power and the Puntland Maritime Forces got to work, piracy has been drastically reduced in the region. And if you're wondering how big of an issue we're talking about here, this is, this is the true insanity of it. At its height, Somali piracy was causing an average loss of around $7 billion a year to the world. If you don't exactly understand how big that is, Somalia's GDP in 2021 was about seven and a half billion dollars, meaning that pirates were responsible in like the mid 2000s of controlling more wealth than the entire Somali government and the entire country was worth. But still, that would leave us with the lingering problem of Al-Shabaab. They would subsequently lose control of Mogadishu by 2012, yet still controlled vast portions of southern Somalia. The Somali military would try and struggle for years to push back against Al-Shabaab, who held heavy control over the rural parts of the country. Eventually, in 2015, the people would grow frustrated and eventually impeach Muhammad, replacing him in early 2017 with former prime minister, another Muhammad, but this one being Muhammad Abduli Muhammad. Muhammad, M M Muhammad Inception, basically. There's a lot of those names. It's almost like a French Louis or an English George. You gotta understand that the name Muhammad is quite literally the most popular name in the entire world. It is. Anyway, the entire electoral process, from the clan elders' selection of delegates for the electoral colleges, all the way through to the parliament members' vote for the president, was clouded by allegations of intimidation, of violence, and rampant corruption, with some estimates estimating that around $20 million had been spent on bribes. Even so, the electoral process was still considered a step forward for the country especially considering what it had come up against. And the fight against Al-Shabaab is something that still rages on to this very day. But the Somali military has learned from its past mistakes, and with the help of U.S. Army Rangers and Green Berets training their best soldiers, they've created an elite special operations task force that has made serious strides forward against the extremists with or without American air and ground support during the actual fighting. The problem that they had before was that every time they had been on the defensive, they would typically lose the fight to the enemy. But the instructions and training that was supplied by U.S. forces allowed them to take the fight to the enemy. And ever since, their mission success rate has improved dramatically. Oddly enough, even though they very obviously need to still root out the corruption in their government, the future outlook is brighter than one would normally think of for Somalia. Women are being educated and becoming self-sufficient business owners at an incredible rate compared to even a decade ago. And nowhere does the positive and hopeful potential future for Somalis shine brighter than in Somaliland itself. Now, this is where things are going to get a little bit more confusing, I guess, again. The story of Somalia Land in the last decade has actually been one of surprising peace, stability, and growth, along with relative freedom compared to the war-torn South. Their capital of Hargisa echoes with a sound of construction as large housing projects and skyscrapers begin to pop up across the city's skylines, and its size rivals that of many prominent African capital cities. But yet, Somaliland has still yet to receive international recognition as its own sovereign state by the entire world. There is one exception, though, which is Taiwan, which does does recognize their independence as they themselves also struggle to be recognized by the wider international community as its own sovereign state. It truly is going to be interesting to see how long the world continues to not recognize Somaliland sovereignty as they operate, survive, and effectively thrive entirely free and independent of Somalia itself. And it will also be interesting to see how they continue to grow. Currently, Djibouti and Somaliland export the largest amount of livestock in the world, and they're even developing a fledgling tourism industry industry in Hargeisa since the war has not actually touched the region in over a decade. But it's not just Somaliland that is recovering. On December 16th, 2023, Somalia would announce that in partnership with the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, they have paid off over 90% of their foreign debt as a country, totaling $4.5 billion. Mind you, Somalia's external debt has fallen from 64% of GDP in 2018 to less than 6% of GDP by the end of 2019. 23. This is a positive economic growth in a part of the world that could really use a win about now. And so it is then that for decades, the 
legacy of Somalia has been a war, famine, starvation, piracy, division, and a struggle to survive. But if anything, the last decade has actually shown the world how determined they are not only to survive, but to actually open up a new chapter in the history books for all Somalis everywhere. Thank you all very much for watching. This has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you could like, comment, and subscribe, it would mean the world to me as it really does help out my channel, particularly with the types of topics that we end up talking about on here that carry a very real risk here on YouTube. If you also would like to support me here on Patreon, I would also greatly appreciate it. All links to everything from Discord to everything else is down in the uh, description below. Besides that, I appreciate all of you, and we will see you next time. Goodbye, my friends.